Uh, first, one of the handouts I wanted to, to give uh, face to face class uh, is this one right here. There you go. This is in uh, Brightspace with everything else. I've just confirmed it this morning to be sure it's there. That chart will, and I'll show you how to use it in a few minutes, but it's a chart for, for determining solubility of different types of salts in aqueous solution. And it'll tell you whether the salt is soluble or not soluble. Okay, so uh, last uh, Tuesday, we looked at chapter six, which was just an introduction to chemical reactions, but it also included a discussion of balancing equations. And uh, the uh, helpful hints is also in Brightspace. You need a copy of that. And today we're going to look at reactions in aqueous solution. Um, but there's a little more to it than that. Uh, we're going to focus, our primary focus on, on reactions in any type of solution will be aqueous. There can be non-aqueous solutions for sure. But uh, the more important ones for chemistry in general and for anybody that's going into life sciences are health sciences, um, nursing, whatever the case may be, uh, the aqueous solutions are much more important. So, here we go. We've got a few things we're going to cover today. We introduced the, the concept of uh, the driving force for a reaction uh, last time. Um, well, actually, first we talked about how do you tell when you have a chemical reaction? Um, what are the clues? And then um, I may have mentioned, I hope I did, that some of those clues also indicate the driving force for a reaction. Why does a reaction want to go a certain direction? And some of them like uh, production of gas or formation of a solid, that precipitate, um, those may be also viewed as driving forces. Okay, so I mentioned formation of a solid is, is considered a driving force that favors chemical reaction. What I didn't mention was the formation of water. Um, in aqueous solution, if you form water, then you contribute to the solvent by forming uh, that water. <clears throat> and water being a very stable molecule um, tends to favor any reaction that heads toward that product. Um, there are several examples, but the most important one is when you react an acid with a base. An acid and a base together will form water, among other things. Uh, and that's considered a driving force. Anytime we transfer electrons, if the electrons want to transfer from one place to another, then that is also considered a driving force. And we're going to discuss that one in a little more detail later. Formation of a gas, I mentioned that one. So now I want to show you a little, a little video. Uh, what I may do is, is cut the lights out completely so it'll show better. But when I process the video, I will insert the original into the space. So it'd be much clearer. Sound will be better. Um, So in the reactions we've seen so far then, we mix chemicals together and we know that a reaction has taken place because we get a change of colour. But there are lots of other ways that a chemical reaction can show up. And one way is called a change of state. So the state of something just means whether it's a solid or liquid or a gas. 
So if something turns from a solid to a liquid or from a gas to a solid, then it's changed state. So let me show you an example of a chemical reaction that involves a change of state. So I'm going to use these two liquids. I have a red liquid and a colourless liquid. What I'm going to do is to pour the colourless liquid onto the red liquid very carefully and try to make two layers. So what I want to happen is for the colourless liquid to be floating on top of the red liquid in, in separate layers so that they don't mix. Okay, so I think that's worked quite well. So what I've got now is one liquid floating on top of another, and where they meet, they undergo a chemical reaction. And they're actually making a solid. A solid material is formed where the two liquids meet. And what I can do is to fetch out some of this solid material. And as I pull it out of the beaker, of course, it allows the two liquids to meet each other again, and so they react again to form more of this solid. So if I'm careful... So as I wind, I'm pulling up this material, and it allows the two liquids to meet again, and it forms more of this material. And this substance that's being formed is actually nylon. So we're making nylon as I speak. And if I'm careful, I'd be able to just keep on turning this and making this long thread of nylon, at least until we run out of solutions. Okay, so that's an example then of a chemical reaction that involves a change of state. So let's have a look at another reaction that involves a change of state. And for this, I'd like a volunteer, please. Who would like to volunteer? <laughs> You're very keen. Come on down. Let's have a big hand for our volunteer. <laughs> you would like to stand there. Let's pop those on. What's your name? Dylan. Dylan. All right, Dylan, if you stand just there, we're going to do some chemistry and we're going to make it a solid. All right, I'm going to start off with a flask that contains a solution of silver nitrate. And I'm going to add a little bit of ammonia. Now, when I add the ammonia, can you see that it's forming a sort of brown colour? I'm going to keep on adding the ammonia. And in a minute, that brown colour should disappear. Now it's disappeared, isn't it? Now what I'm going to do is to add some sodium hydroxide. That's now formed a sort of very dark brown, almost a black material. So I'm now going to add more ammonia. And again, I'm going to add ammonia until the liquid goes back to being colourless. This takes a moment or two. There we go. And then finally, I'm going to add some glucose. So there's the glucose. Now I'm going to put the lid on, put a clip on. I'm going to give it to you, Dylan, and I want you to hold that. And I want you to give it a really good shake. That's it. Really hard shake. That's good. That's it. Keep shaking. That's it. So what's happening inside this flask now is there is a chemical reaction taking place, and it's forming a solid. And the actual material that it's forming is silver. We're making pure silver metal. Keep shaking. It takes about three quarters of an hour, is that okay? <laughs> it, it does actually take a minute or two, but the harder you shake, the better it works, so keep shaking. Don't drop it, though. Okay. <laughs> so metal, silver metal is being formed, sort of atom by atom, and you can see it's all going quite black. That's because very finely divided silver is actually black in colour. What we're hoping is going to happen over the next minute or so is that those particles of silver will start to stick to the walls of the, of the flask. And as they build up, we should see uh, silver metal and in the form of a mirror building up on the inside of the flask. And uh, you've all seen those sort of decorations that you get at Christmas, those spheres that are shiny, and they're made using this chemical reaction, the little balls of glass, and the inside is coated with silver using this kind of chemistry. Doing really well. OK, let's have a quick look. Almost there. Keep going a little bit longer. Still looking a little <laughs> bit dark. Excellent. All right. Give it back to me then. Right, so I'm going to take the clip off. I'm going to take out the stopper. Just wash that off. And I'm going to pour out the remaining chemicals. 
And then I'm going to rinse this out with uh, distilled water. I'm going to rinse it out a second time. Rinse it out a third time. There we go. And I'm just going to put the that on. Let's dry this off. And put the clip back on. And if you'd like to just, just give that little polish. There we go. If you'd like to hold it up by the neck, that's it. And if we bring a camera in and have a look at this, and we've got a, a lovely silver mirror. There we go. <laughs> I'll just stand there. OK, what I'm going to do is give that to you as a souvenir to take home, and you can go back to your seat. Let's have a hand for our volunteer. OK, so that's an example of a chemical reaction that produces a change of state. I want to show you another example of a chemical reaction. Again, this is going to go from being a liquid to being a solid. So in this flask, I have a solution of sodium acetate. And this sodium acetate is a liquid, as you can see, but it would very much like to be a solid. It would like to turn into a crystal. But it needs a sort of an excuse to get going. And the excuse is going to be some little crystals of solid sodium acetate in this dish. So watch what happens as I pour the liquid onto the crystals. So I think you can see there the liquid, as soon as it touches the crystals, is turning into a solid. And with a bit of luck, we can make a sort of chemical sculpture. Seems to be working. Okay, so that's a sort of sodium acetate sculpture. Now, oddly enough, this actually has a practical application, and this is the practical application. This is something called a hand warmer. And it's a plastic pouch, and it contains exactly the same liquid as in this flask. It's a solution of sodium acetate, and it would like to turn into a solid, would like to turn into a crystal, but it needs an excuse to get going. And the excuse is this little metal disc, and if I just flip this disc backwards and forwards, that should be enough just to start the crystallisation off, and there it is. And we can see the liquid turning into a solid. And as it does so, it's actually getting warm so it's actually giving off heat and there it is it's turned entirely into uh, crystals it's become quite warm in the process I can put that inside my glove and keep my hands warm for half an hour or so and then I can take this and put it into boiling water for a couple of minutes the crystals will turn back into a liquid I can allow it to cool and they'll stay as a liquid It'll stay like that for weeks or months until I'm ready to use it again. I can use it thousands of times. Okay, so that's sodium acetate, a sort of chemical sculpture. I'm going to show you now another way to make a chemical sculpture. And Chris has been preparing this. This beaker contains a mixture of para nitroacetanilide and sulfuric acid. And Chris has been warming it up. And when it's hot enough, it will undergo a reaction in which this liquid will turn into a solid. This makes quite a bit of smoke, so we've got this special hood that will suck away the smoke from the reaction. Okay, here it goes. Okay, so that's a chemical reaction that involves a change of state. So we I got another video in a, one or two slides, maybe the next slide, actually. <clears throat> and I'm going to try it with the lights on, see if that works any better. But what we saw there was uh, several examples of a solid being produced in different types of reactions. And that is a driving force for the reaction. Uh, let's see, I went backwards, sorry. Here we go. Um, 
In this case, we're producing a precipitate. And let's see, of all the reactions that were in that demonstration, Uh, they weren't technically precipitates. Solids were being formed, yes. Um, but in a precipitate, we start with maybe the nylon would be considered a precipitate. Okay, that would that would be a solid form from two liquids. Okay, I'll go with that. <clears throat> But generally speaking, when you put two solutions together and a solid uh, is one of the products, then we call that a precipitate. What I have here is two Erlenmeyer flasks. One has lead nitrate solids in the bottom, and one has potassium iodide solid or salts on the bottom. I'm going to make solution, an aqueous solution with these. So I'm going to make aqueous lead nitrate here. Mixing, you can see that it makes a solution. And it does dissolve. It is definitely aqueous. And same thing with the potassium iodide. Hopefully I don't make as much of a mess. This is the KI, adding some water. Also making an aqueous solution. And both of these solutions, or both of these salts, are soluble in water. So as I stir, and I have two aqueous solutions. You can see through them, and you can see the solids are now been dissolved. Okay. Now, interesting enough, lead nitrate is made of the nitrate ion. The nitrate ion is NO3 minus 1, and anything combined with a nitrate ion is soluble because the nitrate ion, NO3, is four atoms stretch, and you have a negative, um, a negative one stretched over four atoms, so its charge density is very low. So it doesn't attract other ions in a crystal as strong as uh, others. So its lattice energy is lower, and it's easy for water to pull apart the ion and have those molecule ion attractions that make this a possibility. Same thing with Ki. You have potassium iodide and you have, uh, uh, you have Ki ions that are free in this aqueous solution and the K is plus one. The plus one ions are a big ion and they are spectators for most types of reactions because they have a plus one over a large area as well. And the iodine, like most halides, are also soluble because they're a negative one, it's also a big ion. There's ex some exceptions with those, and we're going to see that one right here. So I'm going to pour, pour these together and take two aqueous solutions and see if a precipitate results. Now, precipitate is when a solid comes out of the solution because we're going to do a double replacement or something called a metathesis reaction. Lead plus two from this beaker is going to attract and hook up with the iodine ion to make PBI2 or lead 2 iodide. And that is going to create a precipitate because the lead iodine prefers itself more or attracts itself more than water. So let's do that. Here we go. Very brilliant reaction. And you see that is pretty, very pretty yellow precipitates. A lot of yellow leads, lead paints, have been known to be yellow, and also a problem. So there you go, and there's your precipitate. And it's a precipitate because I know that I cannot see through the solution anymore. And if we let this settle for a while, we'll get something like this. This is a reaction I did a, about an hour or so ago, and you can see here, that the clear solution is the, is the potassium nitrate ions, or the potassium and nitrate ions, and the solids are at the bottom. That's settled at the, the bottom. All right? So there is your precipitating reaction. The reaction that was taking place was uh, lead to nitrate. Right? Remember your nomenclature. We have to say what the lead charge is.
because lint could also be plus four in some circumstances. We have to say what it is. And then this one is potassium and iodine. They're both the potassium is fixed charge, so it's a type one naming. So we just say potassium iodide. Those are the two compounds that are in aqueous solution. They're both soluble. When we put them together, those separate ions, these are separate ions in solution have a chance to mix. And the lead and the iodine combine and make a solid, which is inside. This is lead to iodide. And then we have left over the ions that did not react, the potassium and the nitrate. So they are still in solution. And when we have solutions like this, where you have ionic compounds, the ions are free floating in the solution. Well, not free floating, but they are uh, separated from one another. We represent them as a compound, of course, because it's easier to track them. But in reality, they're separate ions in solution, the positive ion and the negative ion. But this is a solid. Okay, now, if you look at that reaction closely, you'll see that it's not balanced, right? For our example from last Tuesday, here's a polyatomic ion group that stays intact on both sides. So we can use it to balance. Well, we have two of them over here, so we need two of them over here, which makes two potassiums, which makes two potassiums here and two iodides there and one lead. Now we're balanced. Now, I didn't use the budget here because it was just way too simple to uh, spend time with the budget, but you can do it with the budget method, no problem. That's the reaction that took place in that vessel. Let's see. There's my, get my clicker. All right, so since we're talking about primarily reactions in an aqueous solution. And by the way, well, I erased it too soon. We'll talk about double replacement reactions again in just a few minutes. But um, the solution is formed of a solute and a solvent. Right? The solvent is the major component. And the solute is the minor component. So if we take a salt shaker, um, we're gonna boil spaghetti. We're gonna boil water to make spaghetti. So you got your water on the stove and um, um, you wanna add a little flavor to your spaghetti while it cooks. So you take the salt shaker and you start adding salt to it. What does the salt do? It dissolves. It's the smaller amount. This is the major component, is water. The minor component is the salt. So the question is, why does the salt dissolve? Well, <clears throat> water is often described as the universal solvent, which is really a stretch because it won't dissolve everything. We've already proven that it won't dissolve uh, lead to iodide. But it does, does dissolve lots of stuff. Um, some things it dissolves completely. Just it takes a whole lot of solute in the solution. Some things it dissolves just a little bit. So there's a range of solubilities. But we want to say, why does water do that? Well, water is what we call a polar molecule. Think, when you think of uh, polar molecules, think of magnets as your analogy. So we know that a magnet, a bar magnet, would have a north pole and a south pole. And if we bring another magnet close to that, 
If we put the North Pole close to this one and the South Pole close to that one, they repel one another, right? But if we bring the North Pole close to the South and the South Pole close to the North, they attract one another. So when we talk about polar molecules, we're actually not talking about magnetism, we're talking about electrostatics. So polar molecules are molecules that do not have a complete charge, like a total minus and a total plus that we had with, um, say, uh, sodium ions and chloride ions combined to make sodium chloride. Those were complete ions. Sodium is plus one, chlorine is minus one, and they attract. Well, you can get smaller amounts of electron uh, shuffling where you don't send the electrons into certain parts of the molecules and they stay there. They, they tend to be there a lot of times and then they, they will move around and only give you a partial charge. And that's what happens with water. Let's see, I think we've got pictures here. Here we go. So water is a bent molecule. There's your hydrogen, there's your hydrogen, and there's your oxygen. It's a bent molecule. Well, the difference between oxygen and hydrogen is that oxygen attracts electrons more strongly than hydrogen does. So if we draw a stick diagram like this, and electrons tend to um, move generally toward oxygen, but not completely, only partially, because if they moved all the way to oxygen, then we would have an ionic bond. And that's not what happens here, because what? Oxygen and hydrogen are both nonmetals. When nonmetals combine, they form the covalent bond, which is a sharing of electrons. So there are two electrons in here, and there are two electrons there, but they tend to spend a lot, a lot of time closer to the oxygen. Okay? They're still part of the bond, but we have an uneven distribution of electron density around the oxygen which gives the oxygen a slight negative charge. Not a complete charge, just a slight negative charge. And we represent that with this symbol. That's the small letter delta, Greek letter delta. You've seen the big delta before, like this. Uh, if you've had math class, you know that's a, a delta. Well, a small delta with the negative says, it's a slight negative charge this way. That means that's their slight positive charge, this one. And if we want to be accurate, we'll put a two in front of that one. <clears throat> okay, so what does that do? Well, it gives it what we call polarity. These bonds are polar. And we represent that with an arrow that shows um, the electrons tend to move toward the oxygen and then this is the positive end toward the hydrogen. That's how we represent a, what we call a vector. This is the electron density vector. It moves electrons only slightly toward oxygen, either way. So that gives this side of the molecule negative, this side of the molecule positive. And when you have nothing but pure water, then they will align themselves so that another molecule of water might come along like this. Now it's got a positive, uh, excuse me, a negative and a positive. They form an attraction, okay? It's not a complete covalent or ionic type bond. It's a, what we call an intermolecular bond, okay? So that's what water does with itself. Now, if we put something in water, put our solute in there, and it does have a charge, like the sodium ion or the chloride ion or 
whatever the case may be, then those water molecules are going to align themselves in such a way that they're going to form attractions with the negatives here and with the positives there. Okay, so it's purely electrostatic. And that's what brings these ions into solution. They become what we call hydrated. They're surrounded by water molecules. There'll be more than one water molecule around that sodium, many more. But then the negatives, the positive parts of the molecule that are sticking out, they interact with other water molecules. And that helps keep the ions in solution. All right. So here's a representation of the polarity of that molecule. And that's why uh, most, well, a large number of ionic compounds will actually be soluble in water. The circumstances that lead to insoluble ionic compounds are where the bonds between the ions of the compound are much, much stronger than the bond between the individual ions and the water. And so it's a tug of war. And for uh, lead to iodide, the strength of the bond between the lead and the iodine ions is much stronger than those bonds that would pull them apart um, between the ions and water. Okay, <clears throat> so if it's possible, uh, water will take ionic compounds, which are usually solids, and it will break them apart. It will pull the ions out. And we've got an animation here in a second, I believe. Oops, I went too far. I'm not going to let me back up. One second. Here we go. So this is what I was talking about, the hydration of the ions. They're surrounded by water molecules. And say this is a crystal of sodium chloride. You see our sodium ions here and the chloride ions there. And this is reasonably accurate in a, in a single plane. But remember, this is a three-dimensional object. So you've got chlorides and sodiums this way and chlorides and sodiums the other way. So what happens is the water molecules, when they encounter this crystal of sodium chloride, the negative parts of the molecule are attracted to the positive sodium ions. Okay. And the strength, once they're attracted to that sodium, then the other sides of the molecule the positive sides are attracted to negative parts of other water molecules and they pull and they successfully pull that sodium ion away from the crystal. Now it's in solution. A similar thing happens to the chloride ions, but this time the positive side of the molecule attaches itself to the chloride. And then the negative side is again attracted to other water molecules and they can pull it out. So this happens at the molecular level and it's very fast. So we've slowed it down considerably here for illustration purposes. Okay. So another characteristic of water Water is a molecular compound. That is, the bonds between the atoms are covalent. It does not form ions. So when you try to pass an electric current through water, it won't go. Water, pure water, is an insulator. 
So what you need in order to complete an electrical circuit and uh, light the light bulb uh, is a way to transfer charge from one electrode to another in the solution. Pure water is an insulator, so we don't get a completed circuit. And if you know anything about electricity, you have to have a complete circuit or electrons will not move. The charge will not move. You won't get a current. But if we dissolve some ionic compounds in that solution, now you have free floating ions that can transfer the charge from one electrode to the other and you get a completed circuit and the light bulb lights up. Okay. Now, in chemical terms, if that compound we call an electrolyte dissolves in water completely, sodium chloride is a good example. It completely breaks apart, there's nothing left. That's called a strong electrolyte. And the strong electrolyte will typically give you a bright bulb. It transmits. Um, it's virtually the same as putting a copper wire between those electrodes. Whereas a, um, well, it doesn't say, a weak electrolyte would be something that we dissolve in water that only partially dissolves. Um, many of the acids are like that. They'll only break off only a few hydrogen ions and leave the negative ions behind and when we were naming, when we were naming acids, you have to have a hydrogen, and then you have something else out here. And when it goes into solution, you get some of them like that, and they leave those ions behind. So if you dissolve an acid in water, then if it completely breaks apart, it too would be a strong electrolyte. In this case, a strong acid. But if only just a few of them come apart, and it prefers to be like this, then that would be a weak electrolyte. And many of the compounds, not just acids, but many of the compounds, the uh, combinations of metals, uh, cations and anions, positives and negatives, many of those only partially dissociate in aqueous solution. So when that happens, you get a weaker light from your bulb. Those are weak electrolytes. Now, if you've ever been to the doctor, the doctor ordered uh, uh, a blood test, a blood, just a general blood panel. One of the things they will determine is listed under the heading electrolytes. And it'll be sodium, potassium, uh, calcium, magnesium, then some anions like chlorides. And it'll be listed, concentrations in your blood. Those are electrolytes. And they're electrolytes because they are positive and negative ions. Okay. This example is based upon the same process that we saw in that video where we had uh, lead to nitrate combined with potassium iodide produced a precipitate. Okay, <clears throat> what we have here is a compound this is potassium chromate, right? Chromate is a polyatomic ion combined with barium nitrate. And they're separated first, and then we put them together with a plus sign. So what's gonna happen? What happens is called a double replacement reaction. What we're saying is that these are free ions in solution. When it says aqueous, those ions are in solution, separated from one another. And this is the way we represent them down here. Two potassiums from here, one chromate from there, 
one barium from there, and two nitrates from there. That's actually what is in solution. So those ions are free to interact when we combine the solutions. And we see what happens. Well, um, positive ion is not going to interact with a positive ion. So you don't get the positives interacting. You only get the positive from one interacting with the negative from the other. So that's what we're going to see here. Potassium interacts with nitrate. Right? Then you have to say, okay, does it form a precipitate? That's where this chart comes in. So if you look at this chart, you will see across the top are the cations and down the side are the anions. And all you have to do is like you were reading a road map and trying to find, figure out how far it is from here to your destination. You say, okay, here I am on this side. I run across until I meet the, the column for the other destination over here. And then I read across there and, and where that block is will give me mileage. Well, in this case, we look for the cation down this side, and then we go across until we meet the column for the anion and look at the block. Is it clear or is it shaded? If it's shaded, you get a precipitate. And if you do that for potassium and nitrate, I must accidentally push the button. Um, well, this is okay. If you do that for the potassium and the nitrate, you find that potassium nitrate is soluble. That means that those ions are still independent. So they were independent going in, they're independent coming out. We call those spectators. I mean, they just sit there. They sit there in the, in the reactant side and they sit there in the product side. They don't do anything. They just sit there. They're spectators. But if we take the barium from the nitrate and combine it with the chromate, and it's going to give us this possibility, then we look in our chart, we look at the barium across the top and match it with chromate, and we find that it's grayed out, it's a gray box. That forms a solid. So this is solid. So what products do we get? Well, when we mix these ions together, we get a yellow solid, okay, two reactants. Possible combinations are, I already mentioned that one's soluble. This one is, forms a solid. Now, if potassium nitrate were, uh, on the table with no water, it would be a white solid. But in solution, it completely disperses. Potassium ions, nitrate ions are separate from one another. Barium chromate is a yellow solid. And since it forms in the solution as a solid and precipitates, we see it as the yellow solid, which eventually uh, settles to the bottom of the solution and you have that then you can also separate it from the solution, right? Uh, all we need is a physical process. What can we do to separate a solid from a liquid? Filter it. Just pour it through a filter, uh, and you choose the filter medium, the paper in this case, such that the pores of the filter are smaller than the solid. So the solid is caught in the filter, and the solution flows through, and we catch most of the solid in the filter. Then you take the filter and let it dry, and you have your isolated barium chromate. Okay, so um, what this slide is showing you is the rules that govern the uh, layout of that grid pattern. See this grid pattern right here. They follow rules, and the rules are given at the bottom here. Now, I'm not going to ask you to memorize those rules. I'm just presenting them here. If you want to, be my guest. I'll, I'll tell you how the rules are laid out. 
So if you want to memorize them, you can, and that makes sense. But um, for test taking purposes, you will have access to this uh, chart, and you can use, just learn how to use the chart to determine if you have a solid precipitate from the mixture of two solutions. So the first rule is um, most nitrates are soluble. In fact, for our purposes, you could probably say all nitrates are soluble. So any cation combined with a nitrate is going to be soluble in solution. Most salts of sodium and potassium and ammonium combined with other anions will be soluble. Now, the way this, this rules are laid out is uh, there are others down here. If you have a tie, if you have two rules that can apply to your mixture, then the one above takes precedence. So if you have um, something down here that uh, says it's insoluble, let's go to the next one. Uh, most chloride salts are soluble except for silver chloride, lead uh, two chloride, and uh, mercury one chloride. Okay, that doesn't work. Let's go to the next one. Uh, most sulfate salts are soluble. Well, it's laid out so that if there's a tie, the one above breaks the tie. So we mentioned that chloride salts are generally soluble, except for these three compounds. Chloride, the chloride salt of silver, chloride salt of lead two ion, and the chloride salt of mercury one, those are insoluble. Remember what we said about mercury. Mercury always occurs. Well, mercury is always two plus. Like that. But the charge on each one of these is one plus. So each one of those is one plus. But whenever mercury interacts with other elements and makes compounds, it's either a single mercury with two plus or two mercuries with two plus. Which makes this one of one uh, two plus and this one of one plus. Okay, so that's what's strange about the way mercury behaves. Okay, other rules. Most hydroxides are only slightly soluble, and for our purposes, we can treat them as insoluble. When we say slightly soluble uh, at this level. You can treat them as uh, insoluble. There are exceptions. Okay, so here's a good example. If we have potassium hydroxide, and the rule is hydroxides are insoluble. But we also know that potassium is soluble. So the tiebreaker is the potassium hydroxide is soluble. Um, sodium hydroxide is soluble. Barium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide are only moderately soluble. So let's see what the chart says about those. Barium hydroxide. There's barium and there's hydroxide. Okay, this chart says barium hydroxide is soluble. In fact, it's moderately soluble. So for our purposes, just count it as soluble. Calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide is counted as insoluble. So for our purposes, count calcium hydroxide as insoluble and barium hydroxide as soluble. Okay. Most sulfides, carbonates, and phosphates are only slightly soluble. And you can consider those, most of those, Inside, let's see, sulfide. So you find sulfide here, and then you move across and find that sodium sulfide is soluble. Okay. 
Rule number two takes trumps that one. Potassium sulfide is soluble. Um, magnesium sulfide doesn't count because there's a special note here. It decomposes. <laughs> so it, uh, um, we can't say anything definitive about that one. And then the rest of the sulfides across here, until we get to barium, barium sulfide is listed as soluble, okay? But the rest of them are insoluble. So that's why the chart is very useful because um, if you go by the rules, you might think one thing, but if you go by the chart, it tells you something else. So we're gonna stick to the chart for this class. Let's see, do we have any others? Um, no, there's the chart, and here are the rules again, and that chart is in Brightspace. You can print yourself off a copy of it. And when you take the exam for these two chapters, um, there will be, if you take it online, of course, there will be uh, a document in there, useful information, and it will have that chart with it. So you just need to print it out before you take the exam. Okay. Um, all right, we're, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that previous slide. Uh, it just hammers those rules again. And um, since we're using the chart, we don't need to stop there. Okay, so when we combine two ionic compounds, and these invariably are, are uh, binary. Uh, two solutions of ionic compounds recognize that these ions in the solutions are separate. So when we mix them, they have an opportunity to interact. So how do we, this is one of those cases where I can give you the reactants and you can tell me the products because this is a double replacement reaction. So in generic terms, we would have a cation and an anion in aqueous solution. And then we combine it with another cation and another anion in aqueous solution. So if that's everything that I give you, you can say that cation interacts with this anion. So here's a cation, there's the anion. And then this cation interacts with that anion. All right. Then you have to go to your chart and say, all right, is one of those a solid? If, if both of them are aqueous, like that, then you don't have a reaction, right? Because this is the same as that one. They're free ions, right? The only time you can claim a reaction is if one of them forms a solid. So if we say this one forms a solid, there you go. Now you have a reaction forming a precipitate. All right. So let's, let's look at, let's look at this um, question. Which of the following ions form compounds with lead 2 plus that are generally soluble in water? I think that's all there is. I hope that's it. One more. Okay. So what do we do? Well, we go to our chart and we find lead. Let's see, lead is way over here on the right, lead 2 plus ion. And then we just follow it down and then match it up with the anions. And if we do that, we find that lead and sulfide are inside. Lead and chloride, that's insoluble also. Lead nitrate, let's see, where is it? Oh, it's not, uh, okay, here it is. There it is. 
Lead nitrate is soluble. It's a clear square. Lead sulfate, lead to sulfate, is insoluble. And <laughs> the last one is a trick question. You don't form compounds with two cations. Right? So we can throw that one out. So the only one that's soluble is the nitrate. The rest of them are insoluble. <clears throat> oh, we got another one. Say we have sodium phosphate in solution and lead to nitrate in solution, and we react the two. Get it. There we go. So we react the two. If they form, if they are solutions, separate solutions, then we know that sodium phosphate, we have to write our compound correctly, sodium phosphate. That's a three minus, that's a one plus. So this needs a subscript of three to balance the charges. This is aqueous solution. What's the other one? Lead to nitrate. So this lead has a two plus charge, nitrate has a one minus charge, so we need two of them. And that's aqueous solution. Okay? So what precipitate will form? Recognizing that that's a free ion, that's a free ion, that's a free ion, and that's a free ion. When we mix them together, we say that cation interacts with this anion and that cation interacts with this anion so we could form sodium nitrate minus one plus one that's good and then we could also form lead two phosphate right so if this forms a compound we need a three over here and a two over there. Remember when you have even and odd charges, just cross multiply two and three. So these are the possible compounds that can form. Now then we ask ourselves, which one is a precipitate? Look at your chart. This is sodium and nitrate, right? double whammy. Both of them form soluble compounds with anything else. So this one is still aqueous. How about lead to phosphate? Look it up. It forms a solid. That's your precipitate right there. And there it is. A double replacement reaction. I think the, uh, the narrator in that example called it a metathesis reaction. Don't worry about that name. That's for people who are going into chemistry. This is a double replacement reaction where you swap partners. That's all you have to do. And then you see which one forms the solid. Okay, in this case, we've got a solution with a complex of ions. It doesn't matter how they got in there together, they're there. Now we want to say um, what uh, solids could possibly form from this mixture. Let's see, is that the question? Yeah. When all of these are allowed to react, and there's plenty of each, how many different solids will form? So how do we approach this one? The best way to approach this type of problem is the same way that our um, chart is set up. Cations down one side, uh, across the top, anions down the side. And then where they cross, you see, you check to see if they're soluble. 
right? So where we have cations across the top, we have lead, potassium, silver. We have lead two plus, we have potassium, and we have silver. And then we have anions down the side, nitrate. We have uh, chloride. We have sulfate. And we have phosphate. There we go. So now we can just say we can form a grid. And decide whether they're soluble or insoluble. Then you can go back to your chart and say, all right, what about, let's eliminate the easy ones. All the potassium salts are soluble. Right? So this one would be, um, let's use AQ, still in solution. So this one would be AQ, right? This one would be AQ. AQ and AQ. All potassium salts are soluble. Nitrates are soluble. And you can do the same thing just by looking at the chart. Most chlorides are soluble except the, the uh, lead chloride and the silver chloride are insoluble. So this forms a solid. This forms a solid. Okay. How about, um, excuse me, this is um, two plus. Again, any others wrong? No, those are good. How about lead to sulfate? So we look at sulfate, fold across the lead, and find that it's insoluble to form a solid. And the phosphate should also be insoluble. There we go. Now, how about this one? Silver sulfate. So we look for silver, we follow it down to sulfate, we find that it forms a solid also. And then silver phosphate, it forms a solid. Okay, so that's how you work that problem. You can just form a grid. Anions across the top, anions down the side, and just match them up. Okay, this slide says there are five different solids that form. And what we've determined is that there are actually six. Right? So that slide needs to be corrected. It says that uh, this one, it got that one right. This one, this one are in that list. This one's in the list. And this one's in the list. But it doesn't say silver sulfate. Let me be sure. Match up silver. Where is it? There it is, silver. Okay. Our chart says silver sulfate is inside. My guess is it's slightly inside. But based on that chart, you have actually six different solids there. Let's see. What's next? Okay. Um, all right. <clears throat> there are ways to represent these double replacement reactions. The, the first way that we've done is called the molecular equation. Now, recognizing that ionic compounds don't form molecules. They form networks of positive and negative ions, even when they're not in solution. They form those networks. That, and we saw that with sodium chloride represented on the board. So they don't form com, uh, molecules, but uh, we use that term anyway. The molecular equation is where you put the compounds together as separate units and react them. 
So we show the complete formulas for the compounds of the reactants and the products. This is the molecular equation. And we determine that there's a solid here and the others are still in solution. And this equation is balanced. So this is a good place to start. This is the only place to start when, you, when, you're, uh, when you're given a double replacement reaction that you need to complete. Write it out in this molecular form. And make sure it's balanced. Once it's balanced, then you can start dealing with reality. The reality is these are separate ions. These are separate ions. Those are still separate ions. And that one is a solid. And in that case, we write a complete ion equation. We take that balanced equation and we bust it up into separate ions. Two potassium. One chromium, one barium, two nitrates. Now we get the solid. It's not broken apart, it's a solid. So we leave it alone. And then we put two potassiums and two nitrates over here. That's the complete ionic equation for derived from the molecular equation. Okay. Notice that you've got two potassiums here and two potassiums there. Remember, we call those spectators. And then the nitrates also on both sides of the arrow. Now we can simplify the complete ionic equation by removing those common terms from both sides, just like a math equation. If we remove those two common terms, we get what's called the net ionic equation. Right? So now all we have are the, the participants in the reaction. The barium ions, the chromate ions react to form the solid. That's the net ionic equation. In fact, that is what drives the reaction. And the net ionic equation is useful uh, in practical terms, suppose, um, let's back up if I can. Suppose um, we can't find barium nitrate. Well, let's see. We know that barium and chromate are going to react, so we just, we just need another anion. Suppose I look down here and say, okay, barium, Suppose I have barium chloride. Barium chloride is soluble. And it doesn't react with potassium. So barium chloride here would work just as well as barium nitrate. Or on this side, suppose I don't have potassium chromate. I have sodium chromate. It's soluble and sodium nitrate is also soluble, they're still spectators, we get the same net ionic equation from those compounds as we did from the ones that are represented here. So you're not stuck there. <laughs> if, if you run a, a lab that's, that's uh, poor in certain compounds, then you can still conduct this reaction. You just have to know your chemistry. Okay, let's go back to the net ionic equation. These are the ones that actually undergo the change from soluble to compound, uh, to solid compound. Okay, let's take an example now. We're gonna go from a word problem all the way through molecular, complete ionic, net ionic equation. So we're gonna react um, cobalt 2 chloride. Cobalt 2 has a 2 plus charge. Chloride. We need two of them in the aqueous solution. And then we have uh, sodium hydroxide in aqueous solution. 
So what is that going to give us? That's all we're given. We have to go from here. Hydroxide and cobalt react. Okay. Since this is two plus, we need two hydroxides because it's a one minus. And then we have sodium and chloride. Okay. We know sodium and chloride are soluble. So we just have to look up cobalt two plus and hydroxide. And if we follow it across cobalt two plus down to hydroxide, we find that it's insoluble. There's your solid. Now we have the compounds and their states correctly written. We just need to balance the equation. Typically, these double replacement reactions are easy to balance, even without doing a budget. You just say, all right, I got one cobalt, one cobalt. I got two chlorides here, I need two chlorides here. That means two sodiums, I need two sodiums here, which gives me two hydroxides, and two hydroxides, and we're balanced. That's the complete, uh, the molecular equation. Now we need the complete ionic equation. We have one cobalt, which is in an aqueous solution. We have two chlorides in aqueous solution. We have two sodiums in aqueous solution. And we have two hydroxides in aqueous solution. Then we have one cobalt, two hydroxide, still a solid. And then we still have two sodiums in aqueous solution and two chlorides in aqueous solution. Okay, that's the complete ionic equation. And it's easy to write once you're balanced with a molecular equation. Now, we get rid of the spectators and that will make for the uh, net ionic equation. So let's see. This one and this one, we have to keep that one and that one. That means this one and this one are spectators. And our net ionic equation is this. This is actually what's happening that's of interest in the solution. That's our net ionic equation. And I got it written out here just for posterity's sake. Okay, now let's do a little discussion about acids and bases. There was a, um, I think he was Swedish or Danish, can't remember right now, Arrhenius. And he said that acids are any compound that when you put it in solution, dissociates at least one hydrogen. So that's why we put hydrogen first when we write an acid. So this hydrogen dissociates into aqueous solution and leaves behind a chloride ion. We often call that a proton. Why? Because the, the neutral hydrogen atom has one proton and a mass number of one, and it's neutral. So it has one proton and one electron. So what if you take away an electron and make a positive charge? Now you've got the proton. So that's why we call hydrogen ions, like positive hydrogen ions, protons. And that's good for, for most of them. Right? We still have deuterium and tritium um, as um, isotopes. Okay, how about this one? HNO3, nitrate, 
forms ic, nitric acid. And there's your dissociated proton with a nitrate. And then this one dissociates one proton and makes proton plus hydrogen sulfate polyatomic ion. That's the Arrhenius definition for acids. They have to have a proton in them that will dissociate in aqueous solution. A strong acid, like I said before, a strong acid is one which completely dissociates. In other words, this arrow only goes one way. When you put HCl, hydrogen chloride, gas, dissolve it in water, then you get all hydrogens, all chloride ions. That's a strong acid. That's a strong acid. That's a strong acid. Okay. <clears throat> and that's just what I told you in illustrated form. A base, according to Arrhenius, has to have a molecule with a hydroxyl polyatomic ion in its structure. So sodium hydroxide meets that criterion. Put it in water, it dissociates into sodium and hydroxide ion. And the hydroxide is what produces the basic character of the solution. Sodium hydroxide completely dissociates. Potassium hydroxide completely dissociates. They're both strong bases. Um, so, what happens when you put those two together in solution? Say we have a solution of acid and a solution of base, put them together, what's gonna happen? What happens, actually I stole my own thunder. Let's take an example. Say we have hydrochloric acid and we add to it sodium hydroxide. Now let's make it potassium. There we go. They're both soluble. So if we if we use the double replacement model, we say that cation goes with this anion. And we say, is it still soluble? Well, yeah, it's soluble. And this hydrogen goes with that hydroxyl. What is that? That's water. And we designate it pure liquid. Okay, so this pure liquid just goes into the solvent side and becomes solvent for what's left over. But the reaction is driven by the formation of that water because this hydrogen and that hydroxyl combine to form water. That's why the net ionic equation for acid base reactions is this one proton plus hydroxyl yields water. That's what drives the reaction. Now, in chemical terms, that's an acid. This is a base. This is water. And this is a salt. That's the chemical definition for a salt. It is the product of an acid and a base. Produces salt and water. Not just table salt, any salt. All you need is the potassium and the, the, and the cation and the anion from an acid base reaction. You've made a salt. Okay. Those are common strong acids. Uh, strong acids completely dissociate. Strong bases completely dissociate. And then the net ionic equation is always protons plus hydroxyls yield water. Okay. 
Okay. Now, on occasion, that salt could be insoluble. It's possible. It just depends on the nature of this cation with that combined with that anion. So you could get a solid form, but you always get this one. And in that case, the net ionic equation would be the same as the complete ionic equation. Those are very rare. So if the question pops up, what's the net ionic equation for an acid base reaction? It's always hydrogen plus hydroxyl yields water. Okay. All right, so this just drives the point home. There's your net ionic equation for that reaction. Okay, oxidation reduction reactions. What do we need? An oxidation reduction reaction occurs when electrons are transferred during the reaction. <clears throat> now, uh, a caveat is that you can have multiple types of reactions occurring in the same neighborhood. In other words, you can have a double replacement reaction and it may also be a redox reaction, oxidation reduction. So let's define our terms. And I use this mnemonic. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. Well, loss of what, gain of what? Well, loss of electrons, gain of electrons. So when something uh, loses one or more electrons, we say it's being oxidized. If it gains one or more electrons, we say it's being reduced. And oxidation, reduction, in a chemical reaction, they always occur together. You can't have one without the other. So if something is being oxidized, something else has to be reduced. Those electrons have to have somewhere to go. You can't just strip an electron off of something and say it's oxidized and electrons float free. It's going to go somewhere and it's going to reduce something. If you let that electron float free, now you're talking about physics and electrostatic charge buildup. That's something else. In chemistry, those electrons go someplace. <clears throat> so in this case, our example is magnesium metal donates two electrons. So it's losing electrons. It's oxidized. And oxygen gains the electrons. It is reduced. And the product is Magnesium two plus ion, why? Because it lost two electrons, right? Remember the balance between protons and electrons? If you lose two electrons, now you have an imbalance of two plus charges in the nucleus. That makes magnesium two plus. And each oxygen has gained two electrons, which makes them a two minus charge each. Now that you have these separate ions, and these are complete ions, the transfer is complete. Now you have an ionic compound, magnesium oxide. Now, um, when you have a metal and a non-metal reacting, they're pure elements. They always react with a redox reaction, oxidation reduction. For short, we say redox. because it sounds better. Ox red just doesn't sound right. So redox is oxidation reduction. Uh, when you have a pure metal and a pure non-metal reacting, their reaction is always oxidation reduction. 
you transfer electrons. Uh, that being said, you can have electron transfers between two nonmetals. That does occur. All right. And there's the uh, molecular version of the equation. And this is what's actually going on in that reaction. Here's another possibility. Say we have aluminum metal and we have a compound with a metal and a non-metal. So we have aluminum. Let's write that out. Aluminum solid plus what are they saying this one is? Two irons and three oxygens. So this one is a three plus, and this is a two minus, and that one has no charge. Okay, just keeping track of our charges. So what's happening? They're saying that the iron now is three. It's an element. And now we have aluminum oxide with a two minus and a three plus. So we have two of those there. Two aluminums and the same three oxygens. So we're going to need two of these and we're going to need two of those. Okay, now we're balanced. And notice what's happened. Electrons were lost from this one. So the way I like to write it to keep track of electron movement is do this. Aluminum went from here to here. It went from zero, neutral, no charge, to a three plus charge. So how does it get there? It lost three electrons per aluminum atom. But there are two of them, right? So two aluminums means six electrons actually were transferred, were lost by this, these two aluminums. And then this iron actually gained. It went from three plus to zero. So each iron had to gain three electrons to neutralize that three plus. Gain three electrons per iron. But we have two irons. So it gained six electrons for those two irons. Notice the number of electrons lost equals the number of electrons gained. That has to be every time you balance an equation. That must be a condition. Right? You can't just discard electrons or gain electrons from some other place besides the reaction. They must balance every time. Okay. And this, in words, is just what I showed you uh, in that uh, reaction. Okay. I mentioned this earlier. It bears repeating. Anytime you have a metal and a non-metal react with one another, they're pure elements. Anytime that happens, you have an oxidation reduction reaction. Uh, let's save that one for one second. If you have an element on one side of the reaction, and it ends up in a compound on the other side. That is an oxidation reduction. Or if you have an element on the product side and it was derived from a compound on the other side, that also indicates an oxidation reduction reaction. These are, this is a rule of thumb. If you see a reaction where you have an element here and it ends up in a compound, you know that's oxidation reduction or vice versa. If, if it's in a compound on this side and it ends up uh, as a free element on that side, then you know an oxidation reduction has taken place. 
if we have two nonmetals uh, combined, um, you can form, they will form covalent compounds, but that doesn't mean that electrons were not transferred. We need a way to tell whether the electrons were transferred. Let me take a quick peek at the hard copy and see. Well, okay. Uh, this is a very limited description of what can happen. In order to tell if two nonmetals have undergone an oxidation reduction reaction, we need to introduce the concept called oxidation state. It's kind of like charge, but not really because they're covalent compounds, right? Covalent uh, compounds don't form charges. So the oxidation state is substituted and we, we use it as if it were a charge as a bookkeeping scheme for uh, tracking electrons. But that's not part of this situation. It's not part of this course. So we're not gonna go into it here, but I'll be happy to explain it to you off camera. Um, just recognize that uh, nonmetals can also undergo oxidation reduction reactions with one another. And very often those reactions involve free oxygen. So uh, example, let me give you an example. Let's say you have carbon, right, pure carbon, and you have oxygen gas. Ideally, what will happen is they will combine into carbon dioxide. And that's a gas also. Okay? So our rule of thumb says that's an element, it's in a compound, oxidation reduction. That's an element, it's in a compound, oxidation reduction. But if you have oxidation oxygen free and it combines with something on the other side, that's definitely oxidation reduction. Um, another example, say we have um, glucose plus oxygen yields what? Carbon dioxide and water. This happens in every cell of your body, this reaction. Glucose plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water, and you get energy from it. So there's a pure element, it's in a compound. So we oxidation reduction. So we know that. This is also called a combustion. Even though, even though the glucose doesn't burn inside your cell, as, as we would normally think of burning, uh, it is consumed by a combustion reaction, chemically speaking. All right. So, to review, we formed a solid that drives a reaction. We formed water, acid base reaction that drives that reaction. We transferred electrons, drives that reaction. And we haven't talked about forming a gas yet, have we? Uh, let's see, do I have an example with forming a gas? Well, yes, sort of. This one forms a gas, but it had a gas to start with. We need something that will form a gas from a solution. How about, um, uh, let's see, how about uh, calcium? No. How about baking soda? Sodium hydrogen carbonate or sodium bicarbonate. This is soluble. And we combine it with some acid. Okay. So what's going to form? Well, we're going to get sodium chloride, but it's still in solution. Okay. 
And then we're also going to get um, we're going to get this compound in solution. Let's see, two H's, one chloride, one sodium, one carbon. Okay, so we're balanced. But this one doesn't stay that way. This one actually breaks into water and carbon dioxide. This is a gas. Okay. So we could say the formation of water is part of the driving force, but the formation of gas is definitely a driving force. So when you combine sodium bicarbonate and any acid, uh, particularly if you're cooking, it will form a carbon dioxide gas and cause your, your batter to rise. Um, so that's where the gas bubbles come from when you're making biscuits. Okay. Precipitation reaction. Okay. What? A, all right. We've already done this one. So this is a double replacement reaction. We mentioned that before. It's a duplicate slide. And here's the, the generic that I showed you earlier. Double replacement. Acid base. Hydrogen ends up in water along with hydroxide, actually. There you go. That's your acid-base reaction. This is another example. Acid-base forms water and a salt. Oxidation reduction reaction. In this case, right, a rule of thumb. Element, element, compound. That's definitely oxidation reduction. Okay, formation of a gas. Oh, here's another example. Zinc metal and hydrochloric acid combined to form hydrogen gas and zinc to chloride. Let's see, do I need to say zinc too? No, zinc chloride is, is plenty because zinc only forms a two plus ion. Zinc chloride and hydrogen gas. This is also an oxidation reduction reaction. Notice you've got an element here and it's in a compound here. Or you've got a compound here and that hydrogen becomes an element on that side. So there's your rule of thumb. That's an oxidation reduction. But this is a single replacement reaction. So that zinc replaces that hydrogen. Single replacement. Okay. And then combustion reactions that always involve oxygen and they release energy. Um, let's see. So, if we follow this chart, our chemical reactions can either be precipitation reaction, acid base reaction, oxidation reduction that we've discussed. And then a subclass of oxidation reduction is combustion where you have oxygen as a reactant. Here we have methane and oxygen, right? Methane, uh, if you have gas piped into your house, not from a tank, but from a main line, it will be methane primarily, natural gas. Of course, if it's coming from the propane tank outside, that's a different compound. But, uh, oddly enough, you end up with the same products. Propane and oxygen make carbon dioxide and water. Okay, let's see. What's a synthesis reaction or a combination where you take two simples and make a complex? Example, carbon and oxygen make carbon dioxide. That's also known as a combination reaction. But 
we know that it's a redox reaction too. It's both. A decomposition is the other way around. You take the complex and make simple. So a good example of that is the electrolysis of water. You take water, and of course, you have to put a little bit of acid in there so it'll conduct electricity, but you put a direct current into it, and at one pole, you produce oxygen. At the other pole, you produce hydrogen. So at the positive pole, you produce oxygen, and at the negative pole, you produce hydrogen. That's a decomposition. It's also an oxidation reduction reaction because we had element on one side, compound on the other. So now we can expand even further. These oxidation reduction reactions are subcategories, combustion, synthesis, decomposition. Let's see. How about that reaction? Right? What is it? Well, let's see. We've got elements form a compound oxidation reduction. Okay, so it's this one. But we've got simple to complex. It's a synthesis. So it's both of those. Well, it's also a combustion because we have oxygen. So we've got all three. Now, in your review document, you'll have several examples, uh, problems that require that you classify the reaction based upon this scheme. And since they're multiple choice, uh, if you have identified a reaction in a problem as a certain type, but it's not a choice, then um, you just pick the ones that are there. Okay, so that's a heads up about your review document, and I would advise you to, to work through as many of those as possible to get a handle on what these types of reactions are. Okay, um, we're done 10 minutes early. Any questions? Let's see, did I get everybody that showed up? Yeah, you're all covered. Okay, learn how to use that solubility chart because it will be available for the test. And you'll be using it in the review document as well. And the review document has the solubility chart built into it. There we go, right here. So like I said before, anything that is at the end of the review document, these pages will be included as useful information in a separate document in the folder where you start your exam. So you'll find those pages and all you have to do is print them off and then you can start the exam because if you do it before, um, Lockdown Browser won't let you access them after you've started the exam and you will need them. So be sure and get a copy of them before you go in. Or if you've already printed off, uh, a copy of the review document, then you'll have these pages. You won't have to print them again. Just keep these pages with you during the exam. That's fair. You just don't keep anything else except for scratch paper. If you need to do calculations, scratch paper is fine. You know, you don't have to do all this stuff in your head. <laughs>